After seemingly securing their place in Europe with an alliance with their former sworn enemy, on the 30th of November 1939, the Soviet Union launched a 500,000 strong invasion of Finland across their whole border and engaged the heavily outnumbered Finnish forces. But over the course of the conflict, the Finns would prove time and time again that just because they were outnumbered, that does not mean that they were outmatched. I'm Redcoat History, and this is the Winter War. But before we can find out how they were fighting, we must first find out why they were fighting. The year is 18. And a small Corsican man called Napoleon Bonaparte had just finished beating up the Russian Empire and signed a treaty with them, which basically said Sweden can stop trading with Britain or be invaded by Russia. And King Gustavus Adolphus, the never a big Napoleon fan, opted to be invaded. And thus, on the 21st of February 1808, Russia declared war. And in the peace treaty signed afterwards, the Russians took Finland and made it into the Grand Duchy of Finland within their empire. Anyways, fast forward about a century, and in the town of Sarajevo, some Austrian gets shot by some Serb, starting this thing called World War One. Then, before you know it, Russia finds itself with a bit of a revolution. Or two. That, plus the growth of nationalism, and Finns just sort of getting sick of the Tsar, caused them to seriously begin considering independence. And after Lenin started his little communism thing, the conservative government in charge of Finland at the time decided that enough was enough, and declared independence on the 6th of December 1917. The Bolsheviks couldn't really do anything much about this, as they had their own problems, and thus simply recognized Finnish independence. But many Finnish leftists, on the other hand, were highly displeased with the situation, and began arming themselves. Rightists, not very pleased with leftists arming themselves, also began arming themselves. Soon skirmishes between left-wing red guards and right-wing white guards and Jaegers began to break out around the town of Vipuri. On January the 12th, Field Marshal Carl Gustav Emil Mannerheim was given the order to restore order in Finland. However, the red guards refused to back down. And soon, before you knew it, both sides engaged at the Battle of Kamara. The Finnish civil war had properly started. The reds and whites, each backed by different foreign powers, fought fiercely, but the whites were able to secure the site of victories at Tampere, Helsinki, and most significantly, Vipari. After being encircled, the Reds all got captured, killed, or ran away to Russia. A couple years after the Finnish Civil War, the Treaty of Tartu was signed, which among many other things confirmed new borders with Russia. However, extremist elements within Finland didn't like this one bit. These borders were far too small. They wanted to establish Greater Finland. So they did as any good political extremist group would do, and bought 500 rifles from the Japanese. Then, crossed the border, and began what is known as the East Karelian Uprising, which failed miserably. And while the uprising was never exactly endorsed by the Finnish government, it really didn't exactly help existing tensions between the two countries. However, they signed a non-aggression pact in 1932, and after that, they all lived happily ever after. until an Austrian painter with a funny moustache appeared and concluded that he needed to invade Poland. And in the treaty signed with the Soviets to partition Poland, there was a small clause which basically said, this half of Europe's mine, this half of Europe's yours. And the Soviets' half of Europe just so happened to contain Finland. As well as that, there are also several other reasons why the Soviets may have considered invading Finland. One of the biggest concerns voiced by them being that the Finnish border was just a bit too close to Leningrad for comfort, making them feel that in a future war, some other power may use Finland as a base to attack Leningrad. And up in the north, there were a whole bunch of nickel mines. And while communism may be all about sharing, those were their nickel mines. So thus, on the 14th of October 1939, Stalin issued a list of demands politely asking the Finns to go dismantle all your forts, don't be friends with anyone I'm not explicitly friends with, give me all these islands here, a 30 year lease over this, a good chunk of this, the other half of this, and in return, because I am such a kind and generous individual, individual. I will give you this. Stalin also demanded territorial concessions from you. Unless you subscribe, like and share the video, and go down into the comment section and type out an essay begging for Stalin's mercy. Now, obviously the Finns were not too thrilled with these demands. As the list Stalin and Molotov had concocted was practically second only to them saying, look, we're not trying to take away your independence. We are simply trying to prevent you from doing anything without our permission. Possibly the biggest problem the Finns had with these demands is that they would result in the loss of the Mannerheim line, leaving them almost completely defenseless against the Soviet Union. This, plus a number of other reasons, caused the Finns to reject the Soviet demands. However, on the 31st of October, Soviet Foreign Minister Vacheslav Molotov gave a speech once again reaffirming the demand. At this point, the Finns were getting increasingly concerned, but did not want to start a war. So once again, they rejected the offer, but this time said they were up for negotiation. However, Pravda went ahead and published an article about the Finnish Prime Minister 
Minister, describing him as a buffoon holding the office of Prime Minister. The whole article was basically just clowning on him and his government for not accepting the Soviet demands. And worst of all, on the 26th of November, this happened. Must say, that's a really nice artillery piece you've got there. Oh, I thank you, Mr. Stalin. I've been working really hard maintaining it over the past few weeks. Say, what does that do? Wait, Mr. Stalin, no, don't touch that. The gun's pointed at our own land. It would be a real shame if my finger just slipped right about now and I accidentally Mr. fired Stalin, a shell no! at <laughs> Finland, how dare you? What'd I do? On the 26th of November, the Russian village of Molina was shelled, and the Soviet Union claimed that this was a Finnish attack. However, it was quite obviously a very sloppy attempt at a false flag operation. The chief evidence for this being Guild Marshal Mannerheim had deliberately ordered all the Finnish artillery out of range of the border to prevent a situation like this. The Finns did propose to hold a neutral investigation, but the Soviets were furious, or at very least acting the part. They didn't need so-called called neutral investigations. What they needed was blood. Thus, on the 13th of November, 1939, they cancelled the non-aggression pact, broke off diplomatic relations with Finland, and declared war. And just like the contemporary war in Ukraine, it was at first thought that this would result in a swift Russian victory. At the start of the war, the Soviets had 450,000 soldiers split between four armies. In the far north was the 14th Army, tasked with taking Petsamo and then Rovanemi. Below that was the 9th Army, tasked with slicing Finland in half. Above the Gladiga was the 8th Army, tasked with breaking through Finnish defences and attacking the Mannerheim line from the rear. And finally was the 7th Army on the Karelian Isthmus, tasked with breaking the Mannerheim line line and pushing onward to Vipari and finally Helsinki. Soviet high command was extremely optimistic at how easy the war would be. They believed that they could simply use their sheer size to steamroll over the Finnish forces and would be eating ice cream in Helsinki by Stalin's birthday. And at first this seemed completely believable. For all, the Finns only had 130,000 men and the Soviets 450,000. On top of that, they only had three weeks worth of artillery shells, an insignificantly small air force and no tanks. So you would expect this to be an absolute stomp, I suppose. Well, in the far north, the Soviets were able to secure the town of Petsamo with relative ease. And this is about the last thing that would go well for the Soviets for some time. In the opening days of the war, the Soviets attempted to crush Finnish morale through bombing runs on Helsinki. But all this did was make the Finns very, very angry and more determined than ever to fight. Then the military failures began to pile up. In the far north, in the Battle of Sala, the Soviets were able to push the Finns to the Kemjoki River. But the Finns ended up harassing their supply lines so heavily that the Soviets had to use a whole third of the attacking force to defend supply lines. Since this was simply unsustainable, they were forced to retreat to Markiavi, where they would remain for the rest of the war. In the famous Battle of Somo Salmi, the Finns were once again able to crush a Soviet advance. It started on the road to Palovar, where a small group of Finns were able to hold off the Soviets for four days. But ultimately, the Soviets were able to capture the town of Palovara before heading south to Suma Salmi. Along the Rete road to Suma Salmi, I love Finnish pronunciation, two Finnish companies were successfully holding off a Soviet regiment until they realized they were being flanked from Palovara, causing them all to retreat to Suma Salmi, then burn the village and retreat over the river. And this is where the trolling begins. On the 9th of December 1939, the Soviets attempted to attack over the river and field. Mannerheim by now had found out about the situation and deployed the 27th Regiment to bolster the line. Shortly afterwards, the Finns blocked the road to prevent Soviet supplies from flowing, four encircling the whole town. They then went ahead and sent out a truckload of skirmishers to harass Soviet supply lines, further worsening their situation. Several attempts to break and break out the defenders were made, including the Soviets moving in the 44th Division. But after more Finnish reinforcements arrived and Soviet supplies dwindled due to skirmishers, the Finns eventually launched a successful counteroffensive, finally breaking the Soviet lines and forcing them to retreat, which at first was fairly well coordinated with only minimal losses. But as the Finns began to catch up with them and started increasingly harassing them, the whole thing sort of began falling apart, becoming a little more than a mad dash for the border, resulting in the Finns capturing quite a sizable amount of equipment. Let's run down the list, shall we? 625 rifles, 3 light machine guns, 19 machine guns, 12 anti-tank guns, 27 an anti-aircraft gun, 26 tanks, 2 armoured cars, 4 barrels of machine gun ammunition, a horse, 
350 trucks, 881 cars, 2 tractors, 11 field kitchens, 800,000 rounds of rifle ammunition, 9,000 artillery shells, field hospital, skis, snowsuits, handguns, baggage trains, and a bakery. No, I did not make that last one up. If my source is correct, they stole a full-blown bakery. Afterwards, Finns also went about routing the 44th Division in the Battle of Rata Road, by sending out troops to flank them. These troops engaged the Soviets in close quarters combat, cut roads with trees, and divided the Soviet troops into several smaller pockets, which began to experience heavy attrition from Finnish raids. On the 6th of January, Commander Alexei Vinogradov got permission to retreat his division, and by permission to retreat, he evidently meant permission to say, Gentlemen, it has come to my attention. That was screwed. Run every man for himself. Last ones of the borders, raw egg, and also probably a rotten corpse. And so began another completely disorganized retreat, with even more casualties and equipment captured. There was also fighting in the area above Lake Ladoga, which I would summarize if it wasn't for the fact that the sheer complexity of this front makes Karl von Clausewitz's on war seem like a children's publication. However, the most notorious tactic of the whole war was used heavily on this front, the Motti, which in Finnish basically means a pile of fire which stacked, secured, and ready to be chopped. The tactic was basically just encircle and destroy, but with significant emphasis on using terrain and indirect engagement in order to encircle the enemy. The Soviets would once again face a bit of a pickle in the Battle of Varolampi Pond, which started by the Soviets attempting to pull a flanking maneuver on the Finns, and they were able to make some lightly defended supply companies run away. However, the Soviets stopped advancing. Why? Well, something along the lines of this happened. No. No way. Hey, Ivan, come and look at this. No. They, they have, have food. food. We don't get that. Hey, we'll tuck in while you can. While the Soviets were eating, a Finnish officer was able to re-rally retreating forces, including many field cooks and medics. And I know I use frying pans to demonstrate literally any type of conflict. But when the counterattack known as the Sausage War came, they were quite literally beating each other up with frying pans. Well, mostly bayonets, but this is funnier. And in the end, the advance was repulsed. Just as in the south, there were many more Soviet advances repulsed along the main Finnish defense, the Mannerheim Line. In the opening day of the war, the Soviets captured all the abandoned land in front of the line. And it was here that they just so happened to find the Finnish government. And within just one day, they managed to agree on every last term of Maltov's demands. Give me Hanko. Done. Give me your water bottle. Sure. Give me your clothes. Of course. I think you get the idea. Now, if all this sounds a bit fishy to you, that's because it is. The Finnish Democratic Republic, as it was called, was little more than a puppet government set up by Red Finns who had fled to Russia after the Civil War. However, its creation made it very clear that this war was not merely a war over territorial concessions, but over the survival of Finland as a free and independent nation from the Soviet Union. Anyways, back to Karelia, the one place where conventional warfare could actually happen. Yet still, the Soviets found that their tactics were utterly useless. In the east of Isthmus, the Soviets attempted to take Taipei. However, the offensive got stuck in the swamps and blown to shreds with artillery. Alright boys, that didn't quite work, so I'm thinking we should probably go back to the drawing board in this one and reevaluate our plans and maybe draw up new and improved ones to take Taipei. Yeah, I guess. Uh, we could alternatively do the exact same thing again, but this time it'll work. I think. He's a genius. He's an absolute genius. So they attacked Taipei again, and the results were predictable. In the meantime, the Soviets had switched their focus to the western side and began attacks on the town of Suma and the Lede Road, which failed due to a wacky tactic executed by the Finnish called ignoring the tanks, shooting the infantry that come behind the tanks, and later going back with tank destroyer units and killing the tanks, which caused absolutely ridiculous tank casualties. On the 22nd of November, the Finns attempted their own counteroffensive. However, this failed for a variety of reasons and cost them very dearly. On the 24th, the Soviets had one last attempt taking Taipei, and this time they were able to secure a bridgehead for all of about five minutes until they were beaten back by a Finnish counteroffensive. After this, the Soviets decided that they had had enough and stopped attacking to go and rethink their choices. So why on earth was everything going so horribly wrong for the Soviet Union? Well, part of the reason is that the Finns were genuinely actually quite good at fighting, particularly in their own land, which is mostly forests, rivers, and lakes. They were completely used to the harsh Finnish winters, while the Russians were not. They also made extensive use of snipers such as Simo Heha, whose 
claim to have a total kill count of 505 kills, the most of any sniper in history. They also made extensive use of improvised weapons such as wooden landmines and Molotov cocktails, the latter of which got its name during this war. They also just had a general attitude of stoicism about them, described by the word Sisu. The other reason the Soviets were doing horribly was because of Stalin, who insisted on shooting the employee of the week. Every week. 365 days a year. He had purged almost every last competent officer from the Red Army, leaving only incompetent and politically compromised idiots. He made stupid decisions such as using the same tactics over and over again, attempting blitzkrieg tactics in six feet of snow, dragging out anti-tank guns when the enemy possessed literally zero tanks, and many more. However, while the Finns were doing shockingly well, they did realize they could not hold out forever and would need foreign intervention if were going to leave the war unscathed. So they began the grand quest to look for allies, and Sweden was looking like a great candidate. After all, the Swedish population was extremely pro-Finnish, and had sent over many volunteers and supplies. However, their government was not so keen, with their king making a speech against intervention on the 19th of February 1940. Alright, well that one didn't really work. How about France and Britain? They both expressed deep interest in helping Finland, and made several elaborate plans to help them, many of which involved invading Sweden in Norway. Vods invading Sweden and Norway, that can't be right. So yes, the Allies had barely any genuine interest in helping the Finns. They only saw the war as a convenient pretext to stop the Germans from getting at Scandinavian iron mines, as very little was to be sent to Finland. These offers would, however, continue to be given throughout the rest of the war. Finland had not been running on three weeks' worth of artillery shells for over four weeks. To further make the situation more dire, during January the Soviets had been spending time fixing their army by retraining troops, removing Moving useless officers and improving tactics and other such actions in order to finally break Finland. And it all seemed like sooner or later, if something didn't change, something of theirs would crack. Their main focus of attack would be on the Karelian Isthmus, the one place where it was somewhat possible to carry out conventional warfare. Here they decided to leverage their sheer numerical advantage against the Finns. They crammed tons more units in for renewed attacks. On February 1st, the Soviets began pretty attacks in the Suma sector before going all out on the 11th. And by the evening of the 11th, it had finally happened. The Mannerheim line was breached. The line that had held out the entire war so far was finally broken. The Finns did attempt to patch the hole with a counterattack, but this failed mainly due to lack of manpower. While this was all going on, the Finns had been desperately attempting to negotiate with the Soviets. However, they only seemed interested in talking to their puppet government. Back to the Mannerheim line, where Field Marshal Mannerheim decided to withdraw troops from the west side of the Mannerheim line to the interim line. However, shortly after that, they were already considering a retreat to the rear line due to dis agreements among the officers. Back to the negotiation front, the Finns were facing difficulties as the Soviet idea of negotiation was, look, you shut up and give me exactly what I want to the letter. On the Krillin Isthmus, the situation continued to deteriorate, making negotiation more and more critical. On the 25th of February, the only Finnish tank action of the entire war occurred, using tanks they had bought from the British and stole from the Soviets during the war. However, it failed miserably, and only served to continue to highlight how desperate the Finns were getting. On the 27th, the Finns were ordered to fall back to the rear line, including the town of Vipari. On the 4th of March, a Soviet naval invasion landed on the west side of Vipari, trying to encircle it. The following battle, with the Soviets attempting to encircle Vipari and the Finns attempting to dislodge the bridgehead, resulted in some of the most intense fighting of the whole war. During these days, the British and French were also desperately attempting to convince the Finns to just hold on for a few more weeks to try Trust me, we've got help on the way. We definitely aren't trying to buy more time to invade Norway and Sweden. We promise. Pinky promise. Pinky promise with a cherry on top. The Soviets were finally able to make a landing behind Taipei, and it looked like the whole front was about to collapse. But then... Peace treaty! In the negotiation, the Finns were in no real place to negotiate. They had long since ran out of pretty much everything, and were ultimately forced to accept the Soviet demands, and more. However, they had been able to prevent the Soviets from fully subjugating them. The Soviet Union had won the war, but at what cost? They had gone into the war and expected for it to be over within two or so weeks. Instead, they got absolutely clowned on by the Finns, and humiliated on the international stage. 
damage. They had taken ridiculous casualties in manpower, lost at least a thousand tanks, and ultimately gained very little territory for their efforts. But just because Finland remained independent does not mean it got away unscathed. The Finns, while they had avoided the worst case scenario, had still lost 11% of their land, and had seriously damaged their economy in the process. They had also lost most of their natural defences to the Soviets. This, and feeling completely sold out by the Allies, who frequently promised help but never really delivered, pushed the Finns back towards an old ally. And a few years later, they would wage a new war against the Soviet Union, which would come to be known as...